ionic bonding, one of the big classifications of bonding. And we're going to take a close look at this type of bonding in terms of the energy that's involved. And I want to point out that the formation of an ionic compound from the elements can be very energetic or exothermic might be a word that we use a lot to say energy is given off. Say in this picture, what you're looking at here is like a cylinder formed of chlorine gas. Someone put chlorine gas in this cylinder. It's kind of greenish. And then over here in this little bottle, we have some sodium separate from the chlorine at first. But you put them together, they come into contact at the chemical level, and they start to react with one another. This reaction, which forms the ionic compound, the product sodium chloride, is very exothermic. It releases a lot of energy. So let's try to understand why all this energy is being released. Let's think about everything that has to happen to form that ionic compound from the elements. Well, we start with sodium metal. All those atoms basically have no charge. We know that we have to have sodium ions in the product. So one of the one of the steps that we must go through is we have to ionize sodium atoms. Well, that energy is a positive energy. It takes energy to remove electrons from sodium. And the removal of one electron is referred to as the first ionization energy. So removing one electron from each of a mole of gas phase sodium atoms would actually require an input of energy. 495 kilojoules per mole. Now let's uh, take that electron from sodium and giving it to chlorine because we know in the product sodium chloride we have to have chloride ions. So that can be part of the overall hypothetical process. Let's add those electrons. Add an electron to each of them of a mole of chlorine atom. So that releases energy, releases 349 kilojoules per mole of chlorine atoms having electrons added to them. So that releases energy. So let's look at these two steps so far. First we had to ionize the sodium in the gas phase. That took energy. But then we added, broke this down step by step, imagining this happening in steps. Then adding the electrons to chlorine, and then that releases 349. Okay, so we put energy in, we get some of that energy back. But overall, if we're just looking at the formation of ions in the gas phase from atoms in the gas phase, the ionization by itself doesn't account for why so much energy is being released. To do this would require 146 kilojoules per mole. So you're actually going uphill. You have to invest energy to make this happen. But we're trying to understand why we get so much energy back. There must be more to this story. We also have to add into this scenario the effect of the electrostatic attraction between those ions. Not only do we form them, we let them interact with one another. Okay, so let's this depicts a sodium atom losing an electron. Of course, the nucleus of sodium has 11 protons in it, so it's got 11 positive charge. Starting off, it's got 11 electrons because it's a neutral atom which has numerically the same number of protons as it does electrons. Okay, so we lose an electron, the nucleus stays the same, but there's only 10 electrons. That's what's happening to the sodium. Now to depict what's happening to the chlorine, chlorine which has 17 protons, 17 electrons, gains an electron. Number of protons in the nucleus stays the same, but we've gone from 17 to 18 electrons. So we've got positive and negatively charged ions. Okay, but now they're attracted to one another. They simply fall in love with one another because they've got opposite charges. In an electrical sense, they are attracted to one another. We have to look at the energetics, the amount of energy involved in this attraction. Well, we'll just say, so let's just formally define lattice stability. It's the energy that is released when gaseous cations and anions combine to form one mole of a solid ionic compound. So say for here, if you have some uh, one mole of sodium ions and a mole of chloride ions in the gas phase, but they're kind of separated from one another, non-interacting, so far apart that they're not really interacting, then they come together under their attraction and they form a solid. Well, that process is like a weight falling to the ground or something, becoming more stable. And 
in that process, there's minus or negative 788 kilojoules of energy released per mole. So that's the formation of a lattice and the thing called lattice stability. It's the amount of energy that you would get out were you al to allow that lattice to form from infinitely separated gas phase ions. Well, sometimes you'll see lattices and other chemical things for that matter, such as just chemical bonds, described in terms of their energy. And um, the energy, lattice energy in this case, is the energy required to re completely separate a mole of a sol solid ion compound into its gaseous ions. So basically, stability, you see how this is the opposite process. The stability is when the lattice forms. The energy is the amount of energy that we have to put in to make this process happen, which is the opposite. Here we take the lattice and blow it up into infinitely separated gas phase ions. You can talk about lattices and how stable they are in two ways. You can talk about the energy that you get off if you form the lattice, or you can talk about how much energy it takes to break the lattice up. Now we know that the lattice forms, and I should point out that it releases 788 kilojoules of energy when that lattice forms. And if you'll remember, to form the ions in the gas phase, there was actually an input of energy needed. So this won't happen, but yet these ions do form. They form because in the overall process, there's a lattice being formed, and the lattice formation releases enough energy to overcome this, I guess, down payment of energy that hypothetically must be made. Now we have one way of understanding the octet rule. Say, if we ask the question, well, why do we have sodium ions with just one positive charge being formed? Why not sodium 2 positive? After all, wouldn't that maybe make for a more stable lattice if you had sodium plus 2? But the thing is, you also have to consider how much energy it takes to ionize the metal compared to how much energy becomes available by forming the lattice. And in the case of sodium, this alkali metal, sure, it takes 495 kilojoules of energy per mole of atoms to, to remove the first electron. But if you were to turn it into sodium 2 positive, it would take 4,562 kilojoules of mole, kilojoules per mole of energy, in addition to the first 495. Okay, when the lattice forms, we can only get mm, something of the order of seven or 800 kilojoules per mole of energy given back to us. We will never get back enough energy from the formation of a lattice to, I guess, compensate for this huge investment of energy which must go in. So this is part of the reason why sodium only ionizes to sodium positive. Okay, now let's take a quick look at the stability of lattices, how stable they are, or in other opposite sense, how difficult they are to break up. Okay, so two factors control this control the stability of the lattice. The charge on the ions, as you can see here in this equation for this electrical potential energy, has Q1 and Q2. The larger the charges, the more stable the lattice is. Lattices with positive 2 or negative 2 charges on the ions tend to be more stable than then lattices formed from ions that just have positive one or negative one charges on the ions. Another factor is the size of the ions. See this R, the separation between the two charged objects. And so the smaller the R, the larger the stability. Ions formed, or lattices formed from small ions can pack more closely, increasing stability. Let's look at this overall graph, which shows the lattice energy for all these different ions. Remember I said that you can talk about lattices in terms of their stability or the energy, with, with the energy being basically the energy that's needed to blow them up. So you always have to put energy in to break up something that's stable. So here you'd have to put in these amounts of energy to break up the lattices. And there's like 16 lattices on this graph. 
each lattice being the combination of an of a cation and an anion, and there's four of them. So four potential cations, four potential anions leads to 16 different combinations. Each of these points is a combination lattice. So here the lattice that's formed from lithium fluoride is the most stable on this graph. All of the lattices here are have the same positive one cations charge and negative one anions charge. So that's that factor is held constant. What really differs across these lattices is the sizes of the cations and anions. And here, lithium fluoride it has the combination of the smallest cation with the smallest anion. So it has the highest energy. It would be the most difficult to blow up. That lithium fluoride lattice would be the most difficult to blow up out of all these combinations. The easiest one to rip apart or blow up would be the rubidium iodide because those ions are the largest. It's a combination of the largest cation with the largest anion. So those that enter, it stabilized the least. Does that make nice sense for you? So this is a question that I would ask as a clicker question in my class. But I'll just give you a second to read through this. And you can put the video on pause and try to come up with the answer.